Okay. See, I told you I have a loud voice, and we need the microphone, but it's the recording it. Sorry, just give me a second to wow, plug in. Yeah. <coughs> I think that's maybe the worst way to start a morning is to hear your own voice. Uh, so. Um, so before we get started, um, I just wanted to get like a quick sense for, um, I guess what people value in conferences first. Uh, I go to a number of conferences myself. I'm going to stand over here so I'm not looking directly at the light. Uh, I go to a number of conferences myself and I'm always kind of curious um, what people value. So how many people value um, just broad concepts or kind of like patterns or, or kind of less pragmatic um, aspects uh, of a talk. How many people like those types of things? Yeah? Okay, and, and how many people like, okay, what I just learned in that talk, I'll be able to take back to my job or to my hobby or whatever it might be, and I can directly apply that. How many people like those types of things? Perfect, I, I optimize for the second thing, so that works out well. Uh, the other thing that I found personally that's uh, really valuable in conferences is actually meeting the people that you're attending the conference with. Um, one of the little uh, kind of tricks that I found that helps is when a speaker forces you to meet someone you haven't met already. Uh, so why don't you spend like a first minute as I quickly make sure that everything's working, um, just introducing yourself to someone who have, you haven't met yet, uh, and then we'll be ready to go. So just reach across the table or um, just say hi. <laughs> making session, uh, but I suspect there will be other times for you uh, to continue that conversation. <clears throat> Is that a helpful way to start meeting people? Yeah. Yes? Perfect. Yeah. You'll see that I'm really into like continuous feedback, uh, which is appropriate <laughs> for this topic. Um, so I started, the, I think the topic in the, uh, um, in the syllabus or in the agenda was um, how important it is to involve your end users as part of your development process. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, but as I wrote it on the slide, I realized it looked horribly ugly, uh, and so I changed the topic, uh, the name of the topic, but largely the same concept. Um, but as I reflected on the talk, one of the things I want to um, really get a sense for or talk about is mobile app development um, and how potentially anti-agile it is. Uh, so how many people here either work directly or work on part of a team that builds a mobile app? A handful of people, maybe a quarter-ish people, perfect. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how crappy that experience is uh, for people and um, how to think about that uh, and then how to solve it. I think how we should solve it anyway. Um, so I'll give, excuse me, I'll just expand a little bit uh, on, on my background uh, to help give some context as to um, why you should probably not listen to me, or maybe why you should, or some of the learnings that I've had. Uh, I went to school here. Uh, does anyone, you don't get to answer this question. Does anyone, oh, sorry, does anyone know uh, where that is? SFU. SFU, that's right. Uh, so I did two degrees, uh, one in computer science uh, and one in business. Uh, actually, uh, Ted Kirkpatrick here was one of my favorite professors, so it's kind of uh, cool to be standing on this side of the podium. Uh, uh, so that's kind of fun. Um, I, uh, yeah, while I was in university, um, I uh, actually had a small startup, uh, and this, the startup, uh, what it basically did uh, is it empowered distributed sales reps um, who worked for companies to um, do order, order processing. Um, and so to give you how, how, a sense for how old I am, oh, this is audibly advancing for some reason. Sorry, just one second. I will uh, figure out why it's doing that. Sorry. It's usually the... Okay. 
Okay. Right. So in 15 seconds, hopefully this doesn't get past itself. So to give you a sense for how old I am, this is the device that was used. This is like the state of the art in terms of mobile form factors. So the software we were building at the time would help, I'll give you a classic example, it would help, damn it! <laughs> I don't even know how to get to stop doing that now. Um, to give you a sense for what we were doing at the time, this is the device that people would use uh, if you were a golf distributor, as an example. Um, and so what people, actually hold on a second, I have to get this fixed, because otherwise it's going to be very distracting. I apologize. Uh, who's a PowerPoint pro? You might be able to help. Transitions, yeah. yeah. Event slide on mouse click, apply to all slides. That should do it. Okay. I'm not going to touch it, and we'll see if it does it again. Um, so, yes, the canonical example, and actually one of our big customers, was um, a golf distributor. So they would sell to companies like Nevada Bob's. Um, a number of these kind of golf retailers. And effectively, the problem that they were trying to solve, ultimately, was having these sales reps who were spread across Canada um, and wanted to do order entry. Uh, and so order entry, this is probably back in the uh, like early 2000s, uh, late 90s, um, at the time was a very manual process. Um, and so you would take a piece of paper, you would fill in what that customer wanted, you would fax it in, someone would get the fax. They would then enter it into an accounting system that would do order fulfillment and ship the product back to the customer. Um, and so that was exceptionally error prone and highly latent, as you might imagine. Um, <clears throat> so what we did was build software um, for this device. Uh, and that's really kind of where my interest in, in mobile app development really started. Um, and um, really an understanding like how you start building distributed uh, systems. Um, from there, um, I worked for a company called Microsoft, uh, and so uh, after university, I moved to Redmond, uh, and I spent seven and a half years there. Uh, I primarily focused on developer APIs. Um, so how many here are .NET developers? Yeah, ish, perfect. How many people have heard of the .NET framework? Yeah, perfect, great, yeah, you've heard of it. Uh, um, and so uh, I was part of the team that built the .NET framework 3.0, and specifically, what I was responsible for uh, was building the workflow uh, product offering there. Uh, so to this day, who, who uses SharePoint here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. So should you be required to use SharePoint, uh, uh, if you check in a document and kick off an, an ad hoc human-based workflow, which says, hey, I need three of those five people at that table uh, to review the document within this time frame, that was built by the, that was, that's powered by the engine that we built, and I specifically owned all the developer tooling around that. So we did uh, anything from ad hoc human-based workflow that you would see in SharePoint um, to kind of systems like EDI or B2B type systems that you would see in BizTalk. Um, and so uh, as we were wrapping up that project, um, I actually kind of freaked out when you said this was 2006 because I remember there was this book selling company uh, that was just launched a service into beta uh, called EC2 uh, and S3. Um, and I really uh, saw, I believed in the vision of developer APIs moving to the cloud. Uh, and so I, um, I pitched a number of the very senior execs at Microsoft to go and build a developer platform in the cloud. Uh, and so we started with uh, a single machine uh, that was plugged into an internet connection in my office. Um, and two and a half years later, um, that became Azure. Um, and so I ran a team uh, of about 100 or so of people um, and went from that single machine to uh, geographically distributed data centers uh, around the world. Um, and so that was interesting, uh, both from a business perspective, because we were effectively, this small team was cannibalizing Microsoft's on-premise business, uh, which you can imagine did not go over well with people like Steve. Uh, and uh, it was also really interesting because we were doing it in a very non-traditional Microsoft way. Um, Microsoft, its two biggest businesses to this day are Windows and Office. Uh, and the way that you build Windows and Office is very different from how you would build a cloud service. Um, so think on the order of two to three year release cycles as opposed to weekly um, or sometimes daily. Uh, and so we, had, uh, we learned a lot about continuous integration, continuous de deployment, 
and involving users as part of that feedback cycle. Um, <clears throat> from there, um, my experience with cloud uh, and my passion for mobile, um, I had an opportunity to work on a quote unquote new device uh, from Amazon. Uh, so I'm actually from Vancouver, I didn't just go to school here, um, and so I was living in San Francisco after wrapping up uh, my time at Microsoft, and Amazon had been uh, recruiting me to come um, and work on a new project. This project turned out to be the phone, um, and specifically what they uh, asked us to work on, uh, what asked me to build a team that would build the web browser for the phone. And so Silk uh, is the name of the web browser. That web browser is actually a browser that runs both in the cloud and on the device. Um, and so, as an example, kind of the value that we're trying to accrue there is to use the cloud as a way to accelerate your browsing experience. Um, so to give you a sense for that, um, I think even to this day, the, it's an Android-based browser, it's still one of the fastest browsers um, on the market. There's 17 people who use it uh, because the phone was a colossal failure, uh, which is a whole <laughs> different story. Uh, but for those 17 people, uh, it's amazing. I think it was like three billion dollars poured into that project. Uh, so a very expensive web browser. Uh, and um, so to give you a sense for like one of the features um, and kind of how you can use cloud in applications, um, there's a, a, a feature we called, um, uh, oh I just forgot the name of the feature, I'll describe it and it'll come to me. Effectively what would happen is if a user went to CNN.com, you'd have tens of millions of users because we would use the data from the Kindles as well to get a sense for what the statistical probability is of what the next page that would go, they would go to. And so if you go to CNN.com, we could say with 90% accuracy that you were gonna click this next link, right? Because we had a ton of this data that would go through our, our kind of back end. And so if we knew that was the case, what we do is we would preload that page onto your device. And so when you clicked on the link, it would load instantly. Um, and so it's as if it was reading it off of the, off of the hardware itself, because it, it was at that point. There was no network request that was happening. Um, so much, so Amazon's an incredibly metric company. Uh, and so uh, it was so effective that what we found was that people would go and visit that web page and then they would hit reload. Uh, and so then that network request would actually re happen again. Um, and so do you know why they would hit reload? Because they didn't think it was actually the page they clicked. They thought it was a cached version. Uh, and so it was so effective in that case that we were actually um, kind of in, in putting a, a crappier user experience for them than the one that they wanted. Um, and so the way we fixed that was we'd have a little icon that would come up that would say, uh, this page was instantly loaded by the Silk Web Browser. <laughs> Don't hit the reload button, uh, basically. <laughs> Uh, so again, we start to get a sense for how you can start shifting um, kind of applications that span both um, kind of devices or clients um, into, into, the, into the web. Um, I spent two and a half years uh, building the AWS team here uh, in Vancouver. Um, and towards the end of that project, um, I actually had a little bit of time to surface uh, and kind of get a sense for what's, what's available in the world around me. Another way of saying that is like when you work in Amazon, you don't really have a lot of time to do anything like work for Amazon. Uh, and so it's a lot of work, it's a very short period of time, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but towards the end of it, um, we'd spent a lot of time working in Android, and I wanted to get a sense for what was capable um, in the iOS ecosystem. Uh, it'd been a couple of years since we built uh, iOS apps, um, and I found personally the best way to get a sense for what a platform is capable of um, is to build uh, an app on it. Um, and so this picture um, kind of motivates uh, what we were trying to build. Uh, the app, uh, affectionately, was called What an Idiot, uh, and it was born uh, through my frustration of, of watching bad people do bad things. Uh, so you can think of it effectively as Instagram uh, for bad drivers. Uh, it's purely a toy, uh, but it's a great way to get a sense for what kind of iOS um, was capable of at that time. Um, and so, this is kind of, I think, almost a platitude. Over the years, um, this is kind of how I think about kind of the crucial ingredients for building software that people love. Effectively, what you have is a development team that starts to create something. And so that's engineers or programmers, developers, product folks, designers, marketing. Everyone is involved in the development of the application. And from there, at some point, they feel, hey, we've got something that we want to go and share, uh, that we think that we should get feedback from our users. 
Um, and so they, you know, you kind of go from this development team uh, to this group of users, um, and you ask them to test it. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes those tests uh, are very explicit. It's like, hey, Ted, I'd love to get your thoughts on this color combination or this font size or what does it look like on your specific phone. And sometimes um, those tests are uh, implicit. You don't actually know that you're participating in them as a user. Um, and so the canonical example of that being um, a lot of the A-B tests that you probably participate in unknowingly when you go to a site like Amazon.com or Slack.com or any of those things where they're trying to get a sense for when we position this product or this messaging in a specific way, what's the conversion rate? And so that's a form of a test. Um, so explicit and implicit testing. Um, and as a result of that, you're going to get feedback. Turns out a lot more people clicked on this one specific way of uh, presenting this product, uh, which resulted in more sales. Um, or Ted comes back to me and says, like, did you learn nothing in my computing science class? You should absolutely not use serif fonts or, or whatever it might be, uh, which is probably true. Uh, and so um, as a consequence, you get that feedback, and then you go and, and fix those issues. Uh, go to sans serif fonts. Um, we really we dump the, the crappy treatment for the products on Amazon.com. Um, and then the cycle continues. This seems pretty straightforward, right? And so um, I would argue the degree to which you can make these two cycles really overlap as much as possible so that you involve your users as part of the development process is the degree to which you're actually going to build software that people actually like and enjoy and use. And so um, there's some complications here as to finding those right users or what have you. Um, but certainly um, getting these two concentric circles to line up or to become uh, kind of the Venn diagram to be very, very close to each other um, is, in my experience, the way that you build software that millions of people really like. Any thoughts or questions on this? Anyone fundamentally disagree with it? Okay, cool. Uh, great. And so if you decompose that then, um, there's a handful of systems that are required to actually accomplish that workflow. Um, so one of those systems is a continuous integration system. Uh, one of them is a continuous deployment system, a way for getting feedback, and, and a way for getting kind of uh, analytics or uh, and crash reports. Um, and so the idea of con continuous integration is to really get a sense for every change that someone's making to the product, um, are they going to break anything, if nothing else? Um, and does it actually improve the quality of the product very quantitatively um, or, or not? Um, and the way that you kind of do that is by actually then going and deploying it. And so with every change, you want to actually go and, and, um, and make it available to your, to your users for them to give you feedback. <coughs> Most of the feedback mechanisms, uh, the explicit feedback mechanisms, are pretty horrible, um, specifically when you get to mobile. Um, and so I'm actually kind of curious. When people have kind of a bad experience in a product, a web product, an app, whatever it is, how many people actually write in feedback? Okay. Yeah, it's about right. It's like maybe three-ish percent, three to five percent. Why, why don't the rest of you write feedback? Is it too hard? Do you think that no one's listening? Like it kind of goes into a black hole, all those types of things, right? So it's funny because we spend a lot of time building the systems and software for continuous integration and continuous deployment. And that, you know, you spend a lot of time and energy to go give people your software. Um, and then you kind of disempower them to give you any kind of meaningful feedback. Um, and so uh, you learn a ton from watching someone use your software for the very first time. And to disempower them, to not give you that feedback, is actually you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. Um, and so we do, again, kind of do it again quantitatively with crash reports and analytics. Um, but again, that, that feedback component is, is kind of broken. And so this is made exceptionally worse if you're a mobile app developer. Uh, the way I think about it um, is that there's kind of like these waves of computing. Um, and so we had this wave of desktop computing uh, and a whole bunch of development tools that followed. Then we had this wave of kind of mobile, or sorry, uh, web or internet computing. And you saw a number of uh, kind of tools plug into this uh, or to fill in the gap for developers to build apps. Uh, and now we're, I would argue, um, in kind of this era of mobile. Um, how many people have desktop PCs at home? Okay, like half. Um, how many people have desktop PCs at their office? Slightly more. How many people would prefer to just have a laptop and maybe their phone? Yeah, I'd say, and I think that's kind of the trend um, that we see. Certainly, companies uh, at, I guess, an example, Amazon and Microsoft, 
when you're a new employee, you get to choose a laptop or a desktop. Um, and when I was building the team, I'd say sub 10% of people chose their desktop. They just wanted kind of to be mobile in some capacity. And certainly these devices, if you just walk down the street, um, are incredibly prevalent, um, almost disheartening. So anyway, long story short, um, this is horribly broken for mobile app development. And I'm going to show you why and, and tell you a little bit about that. So it turns out, um, if you start thinking about unlocking a very simple workflow of, I just want to make a change uh, to my code repository, and I want it to show up on my device, there are a number of systems that you have to wire together. Um, people got a laugh out of this. This is actually almost identical to the, um, the diagram that we drew when we were trying to build that Instagram for bad drivers. How many people have driven, or written kind of diagrams that look like this? They're like, oh, I need to do this and that, whatever. And so what happens is you have this um, kind of fairly straightforward or simple workflow that you'd like to unlock, but it turns out it's actually super hard. And when you actually do sketch it out, um, there's a number of these interconnected systems that don't, that don't work well together. Um, and to give you a sense for what it looks like in the mobile app space, um, what you have are these one-off solutions. Uh, and so you have a solution um, for continuous integration, for deployment, for feedback, and crash reporting. And a lot of them are actually um, web solutions that have been repurposed for mobile. Um, and so you have um, kind of a fundamental disconnect between what people want to do um, and what they, how they want to work and the tools that are afforded to them. And so this is like the classic example. And so of those four systems that we want to wire together, um, this is one of the most popular uh, um, tutorials on the internet for how to wire up Jenkins, which is a continuous integration solution, uh, to TestFlight, which is Apple's distribution system. Uh, has anyone used Jenkins here? Yeah, exactly. Uh, how many people love Jenkins? Ah, nice, you're that one guy. Uh, that's cool. Uh, it's, I, I'd be very curious to understand why, genuinely. Um, when we first started the company, I remember one of the investors saying, this thing, you're solving a non-problem, Jenkins has solved this problem. Uh, and I literally wrote to that investor, if you can find me a single person who loves Jenkins, I will stop this project now. So I'm glad he hadn't met you. Uh, <laughs> it well. uh, but it's 19 pages. It's 19 pages to accomplish just the process of taking your build and sending it to testers. Um, and then these are the quotes um, that you would see if you read that. So like the first quote is, wow, that has been quite a journey. That's the author who wrote this tutorial to help other people to go and build this. Uh, and the bottom are the comments that you see from other people who try to, to, uh, uh, to, try to get this unlock this workflow. Uh, so it sucks. Uh, you can write off the rest of your week. Uh, I spent 10 hours Googling cryptic error messages. Uh, so hopefully that gives you some sense for uh, how, how broken it was. Uh, and so the observation um, I had really was that I think if you think about these kind of tidal waves of computing, everyone wants to iterate at the speed of web. Right? Um, iterating on the speed of web is like, I push a change, I hit refresh in the browser, and it shows up. Right? It's an, actually, if you think about it, a pretty remarkable and like, incredible experience where I can change an application that quickly. And so that's the expectation that you have um, as a developer uh, these days. Uh, but if you're a mobile developer, um, you aspire to something to be kind of that elegant. Um, and so what happens is that um, Mobile developers, it reminded me of that quote of like taking a square peg and slamming it into a round pool. Um, they would take tools that weren't purposely built for the, for the job um, and retrofit them uh, to meet um, mobile requirements as opposed to the, to the web requirements that they had been um, kind of catered for. Um, so I started thinking about, well, what does an ideal world look like? Um, if we were to take the learnings that we had from web and kind of these cloud-based computing systems and apply them to mobile, right, um, what would that look like? Excuse me. And so <clears throat> how do we take constraints, really, that are kind of enforced by Apple and, and Android and Google specifically um, and use those to our advantage? And so um, here's the interesting thing about constraints. Um, they enforce a, kind of a set of rules. Uh, and the way that rules are enforced in mobile is that there's really only two players, and they have a very explicit, effectively, schema or metadata for how a project is formed, right? So said another way, to make it like maybe less academic, um, if you think about all the frameworks and tools and libraries that are available to build a web application, 
that's a super hard problem, right? Like, think about if I asked in this room how many people use Angular or React or Node or any number of these kind of JavaScript frameworks to build their web application, it's probably nearly infinite, right? Like, we've seen new frameworks spin up probably three over the last 20 minutes that I've been talking. Uh, and so it's crazy. Um, and that's because everyone can go and do it. Turns out there's only two players in mobile. Um, and they're really close, as it turns out. Uh, they don't really care to let the community fundamentally change the way that those apps are built. Uh, and so um, that's actually a good thing in some ways. Uh, because you remove the entropy or the kind of uh, variability in how a project can be structured, you know you can build clever kind of ways of in looking at that metadata and, and making things like setup really, really simple. So um, one of the hardest parts about a project is getting started. Uh, and so one of the things that we wanted to do was remove a walk away from that crazy diagram of lines and arrows and just be able to point to a project um, and just build it based on structured metadata. Um, and so what you have is Xcode, Xcode projects, Gradle projects, which are a little bit more variable, um, and then package managers that actually have fairly well-defined schemas. Um, and so that is actually an enabler. Um, in an ideal world, you never ever build something like this. Uh, and so uh, I'm suspecting you've managed physical or data centers of physical hardware in the past. Um, that was like the one biggest mistake I would uh, go back and do. Remember I started with that box in my, in my office for, for Azure? Um, for some reason, I thought that was like a really good idea. Uh, this is 10 years ago. Um, and I tell you, like devices at scale fail a lot more than you would expect. Uh, and as a consumer, when you go buy a hard drive, you read the warranty and you're like, I'm never gonna use this warranty, it's totally fine. But when you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these devices, um, they will fail all the time. Uh, and so um, this is actually a photo uh, from one of our customers. Uh, and so they have literally a rack of these machines. Um, and in the same way you wouldn't do this uh, for, probably you wouldn't do this for your current uh, server needs, um, doing this for Macs is like an order of magnitude worse. Um, you'll notice like these things aren't meant to be rack mounted as an example, right? Like these things are meant to be sitting on your, uh, on your desk at home uh, and look really pretty, uh, not in a, in, a, in a cabinet with incredible amounts of cooling. Um, and so the longest story of it is like, in an ideal world, you don't ever manage your physical hardware. That's a problem that you leave to someone else to go do. Um, in an ideal world, that kind of frictionless deployment is something that you want to actually go and experience, right? You want to be able to push a change and make sure that it's, uh, that it's actually available to people uh, right away. Um, if you've built any mobile apps, you know that those app stores are incredibly time consuming. Um, Apple specifically will review everything that you build before you can send it to a, a user. Um, and so if you're looking to get a change out, I think you get two per year emergency changes. So if you introduce a bug that's crashing your app aggressively and you use those two changes, well then you have to wait, whatever it is, seven to 10 business days uh, sometimes for them to, to review it and fix it. Um, so in an ideal world, as you're trying to get those circles to like really overlap and iterate quickly, uh, deployment is, is, is frictionless as sending an email. And finally, you know, the three to four people of, uh, of the audience, um, you want to make sure that you can get insight into your user's experience as quick as possible. So here's the, you know, a canonical um, one-star review. Uh, it says, I've heard, in case you can't read it in the back, I've heard great things about Blank, uh, so I installed it. As I tried to hit the sign up button, you know, the first thing that someone does, it always said, weird, something went wrong over and over. Uh, I deleted and reinstalled the app and the same outcome, please fix. Uh, and so that was the user's experience. Uh, and so I suspect had that app developer spent a little bit of time um, beta testing it across a, a variety of users, they probably wouldn't have seen this. That's like, this is not an advanced feature that we're talking about, it's literally the sign up flow. Uh, and so, um, and the way that you can get Feedback again is explicitly, uh, so has anyone heard the term rage shake? Um, Google actually I think is the one who invented it. So if you take your phone, uh, actually in Google Maps I think to this day, and you take your phone and you shake it aggressively because you're angry, uh, it'll actually bring up a dialogue for you to provide feedback. Uh, and so it's because you just like so just stop with the phone. Uh, so that's actually the term rage shake. Uh, so that's the way you can get explicit feedback. 
Um, and then obviously implicit feedback, right? Um, if this person had been using any number of crash reporting solutions, um, they probably, if the app developer would be using, then you know, as this person keeps hitting set up and they get that error message, it's generating a crash report or what have you that goes uh, back to the app developer. Uh, and so getting feedback from people is one of the things that you'd like to see in that, in that solution. Uh, and then finally, uh, how many people um, use just a single tool for their entire development process? You just use GitHub. Uh, and GitHub issues, and, and you don't use any other kind of integrations. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine. I'd love to work there, by the way, if you, if you ever did that. Uh, I'd just be very curious as to how it worked. Um, but really, like any kind of solution that you build here needs to play well with others. Um, and so, um, kind of having, introducing a new kind of software stack uh, into your development process um, effectively creates a new silo. Uh, and you don't want to make, sh you want to make sure that like the data that exists in that silo is interoperable, that you can get it in and out uh, of various systems. Um, does that make sense so far? Okay, so instead of like talking about the virtues of, of Buddy Build, uh, which I think helps solve these problems, I thought I would just do a quick walkthrough. Does this sound interesting? So we're gonna go from now, I asked how many people like kind of the concepts and academic aspects of it to the pragmatic. pragmatic. Um, we're gonna do the pragmatic part of it now. Sound good? Yeah, all right. I'm going to have to sit down for this. Uh, okay. um, everyone can see that okay? So what we're going to do is actually walk through the entire uh, workflow um, of getting an app installed. Um, you have an Android device, the most like rugged Android device I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, but if someone has an iOS device, I'm going to actually deploy a build uh, to your iOS device. I'm gonna get you to give you some feedback, uh, and we're gonna actually push a change all, all within the next like five to seven minutes or so. Uh, make sense? Um, I'm actually, I'll, I'll, there's a meta point here. Uh, so uh, Ted was my like uh, UI professor. It was computing science 363. And actually last week I referenced one of the topics that I learned, I think it was 15 years ago. So like now I'm extra nervous because of the UI that I'm about to show. Uh, but it is something that, that we spend a lot of time on. Uh, and so hopefully it's not horribly uh, embarrassing. I think I got a B in the class too, so it should be consistent. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna start off, uh, I've logged in with um, GitHub. Um, we support Bitbucket um, or SSH. Uh, and what happens is when you log in, the first thing you see are all the organizations that um, I belong to. So I belong to one called BuddyBuild. We have a ton of repos in BuddyBuild, uh, not surprisingly. Um, and then uh, we have one called Dennis PIBB. And uh, I'm gonna build a game called 2048. Uh, has anyone played this game? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I'll probably distribute the app to your phone then, uh, just because I don't wanna waste three days of someone else's life. It's an incredibly addictive game. And so if you get it on your phone, uh, the rest of this conference will be a write, -up, a write off, I should say. Um, so these are the repositories that um, belong to that organization. Oh, I think something just went wrong there. One second. Um, and what I'm going to do is, I think it's a, maybe I should hop onto the Wi-Fi. One second. Testing it before we came in, and I think I've uh, screwed up the session. Come on. Wow, that's phenomenal. I've never ever seen that. Sorry about that. Like, I literally tested this just before we started, and there's no issues. And now, when you're live on stage in front of one of your favorite professors, uh, it all goes to hell. Uh, so let's see what happens here.
There we go. So, imagine that it worked the first time. <laughs> um, what we've basically done, one of kind of the design principles of Buddy Build is to really um, take a lot of the pain and frustration of what's required to set up an application and automate it as much as possible. And this is some of the metadata stuff that we're talking about. Um, and so what happens in the background here is we're actually going and provisioning in our data center um, a physical Mac. Um, and in that physical Mac, we're actually going to spin up a virtual machine. Um, and so this is a lot of the learning that I had, obviously, at, at Microsoft uh, to do this at scale. Um, and the idea here um, is that you replace those data centers or those Mac minis. Uh, one of our very first customers uh, at Christmas sent me a photo of a Mac mini and said, do you know what this is? And I said, it's a Mac mini. Uh, and they said, no, it's our new Plex media server uh, because we, don't, we no longer um, kind of maintain all this. So they, they moved basically completely to the cloud for this, for this kind of um, infrastructure. And so what happens is we provision the Mac or we the physical host, we spin up a virtual machine, we pull the source code down, and then we start doing a ton of analysis. So there's a bunch of like artificial intelligence and machine learning that we built here um, that we can actually do because of those closed ecosystems, right? And so of the thousands and thousands of apps, there's probably thousands of thousands minus one variations of how people actually work, um, but there's actually patterns that you can deduce. Um, and so what we do is try to get a sense for which version, in this case, because we're building an uh, iOS app, which version of Xcode you're using? Uh, which branch is it actually from? Um, what scheme or build configuration are you using? And that's really to get a sense for how the project is structured. Uh, from there, once we understand kind of how that structure is put into place, uh, what we do is then provision that VM with everything that's required to go and build your application. Um, and so I didn't have to specify any setup files or YAML files or anything like that. It's really as a process of introspection on the project itself that we're able to pull all the dependencies down, all the dependencies or libraries that are required to go and build the app. Um, and so once the machine is in a place where you can actually do the build, um, what you're seeing is the build. Uh, and so this is um, the process now of, of compiling the application. Does that make sense so far? Uh, again, the idea was setup should be as simple as choosing an app that you want to go and build um, and go and build it. Uh, and so that um, is what the sign-up experience looks like. Um, now, the next thing that people want to go and do um, is actually go and get that build now onto a device. So every time I do a git push at this point, um, that entire process will, will kick off. So if I push to GitHub now, um, a new build will happen, uh, we'll run any tests that are associated with it, uh, and we'll email results um, uh, of those tests. But that's just the continuous integration aspect of it. Um, and so now we want to actually go and get it onto a device. Um, how many people are familiar with iOS development? No one? Some? A little bit? Perfect. Um, have, if in your like limited or capacity of being, even being a beta tester, um, one of the things you'll probably have experienced is something called test flight. Um, and if you're a developer, one of the pain points that you deal with uh, are things called uh, provisioning profiles um, and code signing identities. Uh, so how many people here are like generally fans of cryptology uh, and uh, understanding how to sign binaries uh, with the right certificates? Um, it's, it's literally a nightmare. Uh, and so again, it's one of those things that we want to make easy. So to give you a sense for what the process looks like, Apple cares a lot about their app store. Right? They want to have a single way for you to, as a developer, to distribute apps and as a consumer to, to receive them. Um, and so the way that they do that is they have a very tight security model around that, and they want to ensure that the app that's put into the app store has been produced by the app developer. And so the way they do that is using something called just a code signing identity or certificate. So the certificate is um, a digital representation of who I am. Right? It's literally my signature. Um, and so I say, here's my signature, and I give it to Apple. And then every time I, I want to submit a binary to Apple, I sign that binary and say, like, hey, this is Dennis who actually built this thing. Apple looks at my signature that I gave them before, the one that the binary's been signed with, and says, yep, these two things are the same. I'm wildly oversimplifying it, but you get the rough idea. Um, at that point, there's another artifact, which is a provisioning profile. And so what the provisioning profile does is purely a white list of devices that can install the build. Because if you think about it, I can go and sign that build and then distribute it to anyone that I wanted. 
And Apple says, no, 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 there's this App Store thing that I want you to go through. Um, and so the provisioning profile limits you to 100 devices that you can distribute the build to as part of your beta process. Um, and so this interplay or protocol between your build, Apple's ingestion of it, and these kind of um, artifacts is incredibly cumbersome. Um, in fact, um, some people actually care deeply about what that is, like imagining that themselves. And so this is what you would normally have to go and do. You need to find the certificate, um, export the certificate, uh, and then password encrypt it, uh, and then send it to us. Uh, and then you'd have to do the same thing with that provisioning profile. So there's two files, seems pretty straightforward. Um, of the thousands of apps that use BuddyBuild right now, it is less than one-tenth of one percent of people who get that right. Uh, and so um, I was originally going to call this the easy way and the hard way, uh, but that's a little bit subjective. Uh, so we just call it the quick way. And what we have, uh, one second, oh, yeah, here, one second, uh, 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 is a tool uh, that automates that entire process as well. And so what we're doing here um, is literally as part of that app ingestion process is we know the code signing identity. Remember, the, the metadata effectively for that project is very explicit. So we can determine which certificate we need, which provisioning profile. So we extract it, we encrypt it, and we automatically transmit it to BuddyBuild so that a developer doesn't have to worry about it. Um, and so that saves people huge amounts of time. Uh, and now this is the audience participation of the, of the demo. Uh, who has an iOS device? Do you want to do it, Ted? Sure. Damn it. I hope the UIs get there, too. Uh, what is it? Is it Ted? What's the, what's the email address that you can check on your phone? Uh, Ted at sfu.ca. That's what I thought. Uh, so we're going to set, we're going to send Ted um, a build uh, of 2048. Uh, and so I remember studying for his exams and spending many, many days for those exams. And then he didn't ask the questions that I studied for. So I feel a little bit good that I'm going to get this build onto his advice. And he's going to spend three days playing this game. Uh, and that's, it's like sweet feedback. Um, but before, so it's going to take about a minute and a half, maybe two minutes for that bill to get off Ted's device, and I'll ask him to, to walk us through his experience once that happens. Um, while that's happening, though, what I thought I'd do is actually walk you through kind of the deployments part of it. And so, um, how many people here work as part of a development team? Yeah, most people, I would say. Uh, and how many in that organization, do you have feature teams, or do you have feature crews, or something to that equivalent? Um, it, do you see that? Yeah, ish, sometimes. Okay, um, so the easiest way to think about this is basically um, it's really making sure that you get the right version of the software to the right group of people. And so this is the list of people who are going to get uh, this build. Um, from that list of people, um, they're going to get it at various frequencies. So if you're working in a feature team on a new feature, you probably want you know, that rapid iteration to happen very, very quickly. Uh, and so you can say every time I make a change, I want their device to be automatically updated in the same way that you would probably with the web. Um, alternatively, you can say, I have some senior execs at the company. Um, Jeff was a classic example of this. He cared a lot about the web browser, but he didn't need to see every single string or color change that we made. He just wanted to see what was happening nightly. So you can go and specify a, a group of senior execs at the company, whatever you want to call it, and they get those builds nightly. Um, we have a company in New York who sends this build out to 2,000-ish users every 10 days. So they have a list of 2,000 people that every 10 days they go and blow up. Um, and so those people don't need to see every build. They don't need to see it every night. They just need to see it when that community manager wants to push the build out to them. Um, so you can specify the frequency. You can specify the location from which that comes from, so which branch in, in your code. So if you're using, um, if your code is a feature in a feature branch, you can specify that. Um, and then in iOS, uh, the Steam, but I won't go into a lot of detail here. Um, so that build, uh, so that effectively, it allows you to create multiple groups to make sure you get the right build uh, to the right people. Um, what I'm going to show you here is uh, kind of the output. We're just doing the last stages here. Um, and so what, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview. What Ted's going to go through, uh, he's going to get an email when this build is complete, and it's going to prompt him to install uh, 2048. Uh, when he installs it, he's going to go through a, a, a simple one-time registration process. Um, and then um, he'll get a chance to, to actually um, start playing the game. Uh, so it's just doing that device build uh, right now. Yeah? Is this using test flight or the actual 
great question. Um, and so test flight removes some pain uh, and introduces others. Uh, and so specifically what I mean by that is the app processing delays are one of the things that people find very frustrating. Um, or the ability for you to bounce between uh, individual builds. Um, and so you might want to test an old build as compared to a new one to get a sense of what that's, what's happening. Um, and so um, we actually integrate with both. So we have this email, this quick email deployment system, and so literally deploying a build is as fast as that email being sent once the build is ready. Um, or you can take this app and you can push it directly to test flight um, and wait for Apple to do its magic on the other side of it. So, so the deployment can keep on between the server and the specific user directly without the app? That's exactly what's going to happen with Ted right now. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. So he should have gotten an email at this point. Oh, I hope the mail service. Yep, yep perfect. I remember my SFU mail days were like horrible. Sometimes it would take me a while. So press install? Yeah, go for it. Snap's so brought up uh, Safari. And I need to register my device. This will only take a few seconds. So click on the blue install button. Uh, see a certificate here from bodybuild.com and because I'm a trusting person I'll install whatever oh passcode hmm. this is the passcode for your device oh, okay to unlock your device so what we're doing here buddy build for us as a security measure we want to make sure that Ted that device is going to be tied to Ted's email address right so you don't want these bills kind of floating around uh, so we're doing that Basically, secure the shell. So, it install a profile. Okay. 2048 cannot be installed on this device. Right. The app owner has been notified so they can address this issue for me. So, what happened? That's all I'm seeing. It cannot be installed on this device. Perfect. And so, what happens is this is the state of the art of Apple right now. Uh, as we talked about before, there was two. There's two parts of, uh, of signing a binary. The first one was saying, Dennis is distributing this bill to Ted. Like, that's my signature. And the second part was a whitelist of devices. And so, like, I've never, Ted's never used Buddy Build, which breaks my heart, but it's fine. Uh, and so his device isn't registered as part of the system. And so this is actually um, kind of the workflow that Apple wants you to go uh, and participate in. This is the state of the art as it stands right now. And, and it's asking me to send a, what well, looks like a, 40 character hexadecimal value as my device ID. Yeah, exactly. And so what needs to happen now is, I actually did get an email with that device ID. Okay. Um, and so that's helpful. But um, what's unhelpful is navigating the monstrosity that is the Apple developer portal. Uh, so I have to take that UDID, uh, which is the unique device identifier. I have to go to the developer portal, add the device, regenerate the provisioning profile. So update basically that list of whitelisted devices resign the binary and then redistribute it. And so like, remember those circles? I'm trying to get him my software so that he can give me feedback as quick as possible. And now I've introduced this like fairly significant delay between him being interested in actually trying to use it and actually being able to go and use it. Um, and so people, um, the, the drop off rate is horrible, right? And so we spent all this time and energy doing continuous integration, continuous deployment, and then Ted goes and installs 2050, which is the next version of the app or whatever it is. So instead of doing that, uh, we built a feature. Uh, I'm going to spell com correctly. Um, called Apple Developer Portal Connect. And so what this does is again automate that really horrible process. Um, and so as a developer, if I'm using this feature, Ted, if you go back into Safari now and just hit refresh. Automatically preparing the build, registering device. And it's giving a progress indicator. Indicators along here. So what's happening now is Buddy Build is acting on my behalf as a developer. So adding device to provisioning profile. Yeah, and so what Buddy Build is in the background doing is taking his device UDID, adding it to the developer portal. Um, adding, regenerating the provisioning profile, resigning the binary, and redistributing it, 
uh, all in real time. So when I turn on this feature in BuddyBuild, um, Ted's experience is very different. Ted says, install the build, simple registration process, and the build goes to install. And now I've got a download screen and okay. install. Somewhere here is 2048. He has lots of apps, I can tell. It's just Actually, like, not a lot, but uh, what's the icon look like? It's a bright, bright orange one. It would probably be at the end of the first page that doesn't have a... Oh, here it is, yeah. There you go. Okay. So you have it on your device. I have it on my device. Great. And so what we've just done now is like onboard the application, built it, sent it to Ted, um, remove some of the friction of getting it to him. Now, as we talked about earlier, that's continuous integration, continuous deployment, but especially Ted, I actually value his feedback. I'd love to get um, any thoughts that he has on the app experience all up. And so if you take a look at the form factor of these devices, um, I suspect that you, most people don't actually spend a lot of time authoring contents. Right? It's like not an easy thing to provide feedback on the device because it doesn't, it's not meant for that. It's meant for short, small, interactive sessions. So instead um, of doing that, it's a very obvious device to um, kind of improve on that experience. So Ted, do you remember to take a screenshot? Uh, actually, no. Okay. Uh, and so there's a little tutorial. What happened is like if you press the bottom like home button and the, the right button at the same time while you're in the app, Okay. And let them go. Yeah, the sound turned on, so. So just like press them and let them go? Yeah, I, I did it. I don't know if I got any feedback. Okay, I'll just show you really quick. There you go. Yeah. Okay. There you go. And so like a little tutorial comes up and Ted is prompted to provide his feedback. And so um, what I'll have you do is, yeah, select the region of the screen, type some feedback, I got out of that. Take the screenshot again. Okay. There we go. Type whatever you want. Okay. And so if I click over to feedback, I can see now here's Ted's feedback. So here's a screenshot of his application. It's Ted SFU says, here's my feedback. Um, and I can see that he started playing 2048. Do you know how to play this game? No, oh, like you're actually well on your way. Uh, and so this is like, there's a strategy called corner strategy, which you're getting to do. Um, and so um, when I click on the actual feedback itself, not only do I see what Ted's feedback was around his experience, but I get a, the, the, the device metadata that helps me reproduce that issue. Uh, right, so I can see which version of iOS he's running, which is like actually 8.3, which is cool. Uh, uh, he's running iOS. <laughs> uh, he Who cares has, about local devices when you're running on the cloud? Exactly. Uh, and so here's the network IP. A whole bunch of things that would help me understand kind of like what Ted's workflow is. So we've gone from now taking a build, um, just like getting it built, distributed to him, and actually closing that feedback cycle. So, so Ted can start sending his feedback um, quite quickly. Um, ah, that's really annoying. So um, now what I'm gonna have you do, Ted, is if you go back into that app really quick, mm -hmm. uh, and hit the settings button. Uh -huh. um, press it. Make sure it crash. I think it crashed there, yeah. Yeah, okay, go ahead and launch the app again. Did press the settings. It crashed. Okay, open the app again. Now, so Ted's experienced a crash. And so like, if you think about this, this is any type of product feedback. And if it just sits within the context of BuddyBuild, that's actually not helpful, right? Because if I'm getting feedback from users, those are probably issues that I want to go and fix. Uh, and so what we can do is actually turn on a number of integrations uh, with bug trackers, as an example. Um, who here uses GitHub issues? Yeah, handful of people who use who uses Jira. Interesting, interesting, cool. Um, I'm just going to turn on GitHub issues, but 
Jira is the same kind of experience. You can flick it on. Um, go ahead and send me another piece of feedback that says fix the crash or something like that. So just take a screenshot. Whatever you want. It doesn't have to be super technically accurate. Hit send. Here it is. Fix crash. So if I go into the, I'm just going to open up GitHub issues. This is like a quick way for me of doing that. I can see that there's a new issue that's been opened by Ted. I can actually open it up. I can see what he said. I can see the device, the, the actual screenshot itself, um, and then the device metadata that helps me go and close it. So BuddyBuild then starts to participate in actually integrating with your broader development workflow. Make sense so far? OK. Um, what we're going to do now is just take a look quickly at kind of that status. Uh, so if I take a look at this app, um, if I go into it, I can see that the actual the app has been launched once, or has been launched. And if I click into it, I can see that it's been launched once, uh, that there's been two pieces of feedback, and further that I can see that it's been tested or it's been used for just under three minutes across four sessions by one person. And so getting a sense for if your app has actually been installed is one thing, but how much usage are you actually getting from it, right? Like if a person opens it and then exits the app, is that really meaningful? No, probably not. Um, you probably want to get a sense for that for that adoption itself. Um, and so if we click over to deploy, I can actually see that deployment history. So it was sent to me. I never downloaded or launched it, but Ted did all those three things. Um, and and if in a second here, uh, while well, we're still processing that crash report, um, you can see here's the actual crash that he experienced as well. And so if you're a developer, you're probably used to crash reports. They're horribly painful to, to use, in my opinion. Um, this is kind of what you'd expect. You'll see the, the file. You'll see the line number that experienced the crash. I can actually open it up. Um, and this is what you normally get, is this call stack, right? Like, here's the things that preceded that application crashing. Uh, but one of the things that we can do, um, again, to help alleviate a lot of those pain points, um, are actually identify the specific line of code that caused the crash. Um, and so, like, this is one of the kind of interesting things of the cloud, right? I can push something uh, into the, basically into a source code repository. It'll kick off this workflow, and you can orchestrate all these systems together to help improve your development experience, right? And so, instead of you trying to, like, figure out, oh, okay, which commit SHA was that, how do I desymbolicate that file to that line of code or whatever, all of this stuff just happens kind of magically uh, in, in the cloud now. Um, and so I can actually go and see that Ted uh, was affected by this issue um, and get a bunch of information uh, around that device. Um, I'll give you a sneak peek. Next week, we're going to launch a feature that will show me um, all of the actions that Ted took, the leading five seconds of the actions that he took leading up to the crash. So as a developer, one of the things you probably ask yourself is like, how the hell did you get that thing to crash? Like, I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> And so now we'll show you that five seconds leading up to that user's interaction, including where they touched and the device mem like device utilization as it leads up to the crash. Um, so really quickly, um, here's Xcode, uh, which is maybe one of the worst IDEs ever made, period, full stop. Uh, and so uh, what I'm going to do is push a change. So I push it. If I go back to Buddy Build, you can see a new build has been kicked off with a fix. And in about two to three minutes, Ted is going to get a prompt in his application that says there's a new build available for you to install. Um, and so when he hits settings next time, it will no longer crash because I'm not copying text to a zero buffer array, right? Like, who does that? Um, <laughs> For demos, it works perfect, but you get a sense for it. Um, and so the idea here is like you can now iterate at the speed of web, but on mobile. Every change that I push, his device gets an update. His device will get every single update, because that's the way I set up the deployment. If I want it to be nightly or, or what have you, um, you can do that as well. Does that make sense? Cool. So I have one minute left. This is the thing. I know it's kind of a platitude, but this is the thing that um, kind of resonated with me through my career um, and through what we're trying to do with BuddyBuild and hopefully like 
how you should probably be using the, the cloud is really to get these, these two circles to be as concentric uh, as possible, so as they overlap as possible. So the big takeaway for me is like to the degree that you can involve your users as part of your development process and enable them and give them the ability to give you feedback in a quick and easy way, that's generally a, a pretty strong indicator to um, a successful software project. Uh, and it doesn't matter kind of what you're building. Um, it's the things that you know Amazon does when you go to A-B test. Um, it's what we did when we were running with that one machine that was plugged into my internet connection is we had a handful of customers. We said, hey, we're building this code name stupid project. What do you think of these developer APIs? Uh, and that results uh, in Azure. Um, and it's one of the things that we're trying to basically do uh, for mobile app development as well. Um, one of the things I hate uh, as a participant of a conference is when people run late. Uh, I'm one minute over, uh, so I'll blame that to the earlier demo fails. Uh, but thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions.